My name is Paul Holt. I am the Vice President of New Technologies here at Venify. And it's my pleasure to be joined by two distinguished CISOs for the next 40 minutes. Let me introduce you to our CISOs. So first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Mun Valigi. Mun is a CISO at the, uh, the train line. As Paul said, I'm Mun Valigi. I'm for the last two years, I've been the CISO and Director of Privacy for Trainline. Um, <clears throat> Trainline is a platform business. Um, we essentially uh, sell train tickets and coach tickets for travelers uh, on the business side, as well as on the commuter side. In over 45 countries, we operate in 175 different languages. Um, our app is rated four and a half to five generally uh, in the App Store, and we have about 45 million, you know, customer unique downloads. Um, the business is truly international in terms of the main market being UK headquarters, but also European and a lot of growth in the European markets. And we are just under a thousand FTE as a business. So certainly looking forward to having some really good conversation with, with Sean and Paul around some of the challenges around cloud native and security design. Hello, I'm Sean Irving. I am vice president and CISO for Ferguson PLC. We are both a London and a New York Stock Exchange based traded company. We're about a $28 billion plumbing services and buildings products company. Um, predominantly headquartered in Newport News, Virginia, in the U.S. We're primarily a B2B wholesale business, uh, but we have about a $4 billion annual e-com business as well that's predominantly B2C. Roughly 35,000 employees, 1,600-ish locations between the U.S. and Canada, so uh, sizable, sizable business. So really looking forward to the conversation today with the team and uh, look forward to, to kind of seeing where this goes. Perfect. Thank, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Mum, for the introductions. Hey, before we delve into the actual technology itself, as we look at technology, it really you know sets to enable organizations to have a, a successful engagement with a customer or consumer. And I'd love to get a sense, particularly from yourself, Mum and Sean, as to what that actually looks like before we delve into the into, into the technology. So, so Mum, perhaps you could you know just give us a sense of what what does a, a great engagement look like with Trainline. Yeah, definitely. And I think, look, it's um, interesting times you're in presently because you can't turn on a TV or listen to you know, a news article for there being breach or attack notifications, you know. And certainly I've been more nervous in the last four weeks than I've probably been in many years. And I'm sure, Sean, Paul, you, you'll echo the same. And that kind of underpins part of this conversation, doesn't it? So for for us as a business, it is absolutely around you know, having a proposition, a capability, a product for our customers that will delight them, but do it in means and ways that is frictionless, that instills trust and privacy by design and produces an outcome that absolutely is first class and polished each time, every time. And that starts with, you know, getting the basics right. Yeah, whether that's looking at design principles, the engagement, the release, the growth, the rapid changings in the threat landscape, there's lots and lots of facets that we have to take into consideration. But I think the biggest single part for us is we absolutely want to be nimble and be able to respond to the changes in the market, whether that's you know in a post-pandemic world around rapid growth in, in business due to acceleration of return to work and what that means from a commuter business perspective, but also from, if we look at a lot of the, um, you know, buy side data analytics, which we do thoroughly analyze, there is clearly shifting patterns around, you know, who and where and what we market, you know, our propositions to. And all of that, you know, is about understanding customer, using the analytics, using the data at a point in time that is effective, that is pragmatic, and is allows you to pivot. And the only way we can do that really is by making sure that we build in security by design from the outset. 
train line to me is a, a, absolutely a app experience it, it's what i would envisage as a, as a web 2.0 type organization cloud first so i'm going to be really interested to learn a bit more about how you think about those that those types of things and you know how you, how you address security in particular sean from from your perspective i, I think ferguson in, in in terms of the way that you know a great customer experience looks like you kind of have a, a, a different type of value proposition a different kind of go to market as it were our, yes, our, our core business is predominantly a B2B business. And so we service the construction trades, whether that's um, plumbing, electrical, lighting, you know, HVAC. Uh, so we have several lines of business and several um, different styles of customer engagement. Everything from the single individual, um, individual proprietor uh, plumbing service company to the multinational um, multinational construction companies that do business with us. Our, our goal is to make projects better by doing business with Ferguson. So our, uh, our go to market is really bringing as much digital capability and cross-functional capability to sell across our product lines in a way that is empowering and enabling to those B2B uh, customers and ultimately to drive our business model up funnel into the you know the architects, the developers, the folks that that live upstream from the down from the uh, individual uh, trades contractors. So it's a it's a very different style for the core business. Our e-commerce businesses, uh, those are more traditional B two C type businesses that are retail oriented, aimed at. Uh, endpoint customers around specific product lines, uh, but that's a that's a much smaller part of our business. That's great. So hopefully today we can get a sense of sort of contrasting views on on on, on cloud native move to the cloud and ultimately machine identity management within those environments from you know really what are two very different types of uh, types of organizations you know obviously this is a this is a conversation around machine identity management specific within in, within cloud environments and with respect to you know Gartner's definition of what a machine can be is it, pretty it's, it's pretty broad in, in terms of that you know not only does it refer to sort of the traditional infrastructure but it also talks to you know cloud infrastructure software containers applications apis all of those types of things so when we talk about machine identity management now it, it's no longer just specific specifically about the, the hardware itself. It, it's about all of these other, you know, very, very dynamic things within, within cloud environments. It'd be great to get a sense as to what does cloud native mean to your particular organizations? Uh, cloud, has, cloud has become a, a destination point for us for the last three or four years. We, we uh, were a very traditional data center centric organization four or five years ago. And we set, out, set about on a journey to try and move our core business functions into cloud and to be in a position where we would be able to close our data centers really, and our goal is over the next three to five years. Um, that, that means transition of a lot of traditional technology into uh, cloud uh, oriented systems. Our, our goals are SaaS first, PaaS second, and then IaaS if we have to. So we really want to build and make use of cloud native, cloud uh, architected uh, systems and architecture. Uh, we have big relationships with Oracle Cloud for our core financials, ERP, order management, order capture, those sorts of things that we're migrating to. Uh, we have a large uh, relationship with, with uh, Microsoft and uh, use of Azure for IaaS services. That's where we also build and and manage our Kubernetes container environments. We have a large business intelligence uh, presence and relationship with Azure as well. <clears throat> and then over on our uh, our ecom, our digital business side, we have a large uh, a large uh, segment of our business that's being built around uh, Salesforce. So we're in multi cloud uh, multi cloud relationships with our core systems, and then with our extended systems that we have. Uh, in, in supporting those, uh, we have lots of SaaS relationships that cut across uh, numerous numerous cloud footprints. What, what's the, what, what would you say is the percentage of um, applications split between perhaps what we would class as traditional infrastructure and what, and what we may say now as cl cloud, Sean? How, how, does, how does that look? 
Um, I, I would say we're probably about 20% into that journey. And, and the reason I say that is our, our business from, a, from an operations point of view runs off of a core ERP technology that's, that's been in place for you know, years and years in the organization. And so the transition away from that into a biz ops model that lives in cloud is uh, quite a journey. And moving things like, you know, financials and supporting systems and, you know, HR systems and other other types of, of supporting types of, of, of backend systems has been pretty straightforward. Uh, when you actually get into the things that ring the cash register, uh, it's uh, it's it, it raises a lot of different different questions. Yeah, no, I, I, I can I can imagine. And, and Mana, you know, in, in terms of train, train line, I, I imagine, you know, you're, you're very much a cloud first organization with, with perhaps less legacy infrastructure to move over to the cloud, but please give us a sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. So absolutely. So the business is, not many people would know this, the business is 25 years old, right? So it's uh, largely cloud first, you know, a lot of our core workloads that run the business that generate the customer and business interactions that we're responsible for are run in AWS and have been for many years. We do also, you know, have multiple cloud environments, not dissimilar to Sean for obvious reasons. You know, we have Microsoft, we use Azure largely for collaboration services, um, SharePoint, you know, workloads, um, a number of other specific use cases. But we also use Google, so Google Analytics, you know, we're a big user of BigQuery um, and a number of other, you know, ERP, you know, customer platforms, the likes of Oracle, Salesforce. So quite a complex, heterogeneous, you know, environment by all accounts but largely from a workload and a scale perspective to address the, the challenges of pace, you know, omni-channel, mobile first, frictionless, you know, and cloud by design, you know, being user oriented versus enterprise oriented and actually, you know, affording that flexibility, AWS would be absolutely, you know, where our, you know, core focus is now, that's not to say we don't have legacy like any organization which is spanning 15 20 years we do have uh, you know inherently you know insecure old outdated uh, you know aged infrastructure and uh, you know workloads which you know we are managing a lot of those have been migrated and trans transitioned through microservices and modular you know migration into cloud but some are going through that process presently. And I think Sean's point is a really fair one here because, you know, as you tread the path to maturing, whether it's facing into cost transformation or delivering at scale, delivering agility and pace, you've absolutely got to be mindful of, you know, the fabric of the systems, the connections, the modules that hold the business together and any disruption, any challenge, you know, any fragmentation of that could have a market impact. So that's something we absolutely do maintain a focus on. Yeah, that, fantastic. And I think that's a point we'll drive down to in, in, in a little while. Um, I'd love to get a sense as to um, sort of how you think about security with respect to, uh, you know, the, the cloud native side of the business from, from the traditional infrastructure. Are there any, you know, different areas where you particularly want to double down or, or are concerned about when you think about, you know, securing your cloud native infrastructure over your traditional infrastructure? I guess if I had to sum it up in, in just, a, just a quick sentence, um, cloud is about identity. Identity is king in the cloud, whether it's people identity or machine identity, uh, being able to know what's trusted and what's not and to be able to do that across large swaths of infrastructure and applications uh, that you have very little control under the covers from an infrastructure perspective um, means that means that we have to we have to rely very very heavily on the identity systems that we operate in the business um, from there I, I would say biggest difference from just a just as a systems management and an application support perspective is automation and really bringing security earlier into the process through through kind of a shift left mentality right so bringing security as close as we can to the developer's desktop 
and trying to be as thorough as we can before we put loads into production. That's a little bit different from traditional infrastructure where you're more reliant on, on kind of the external, you know, edge security uh, that's out there for the organization and you move a little bit slower in the development and deployment uh, processes. Yeah, no, fan fantastic. And I think we'll come we'll come back to a few of those points. You raised some really interesting points. Man, how, how about how about you yourself? Yeah, I think there's a lot of parallels there. Absolutely. So, the whole notion that you know the identity is the perimeter, or the perimeter is the identity, whichever way you want to slice that up, it's you know the same or similar lens that you have to look at this on. You know whether it's you know, talking about management of assets, certificates, um, TLS sessions, you know, you're up against a similar set of challenges. Now, doing that within, you know, cloud native, you know, security, you know, first organizations with different workloads, you know, whether they be Kubernetes, you know, AMYs versus traditional legacy machines comes with its own set of challenges. And those challenges are around the point that Sean, Sean made understanding the lay of the land, making sure you introduce automation, you absolutely have consistent, you know, infrastructure, intelligence, analytics and capability, you want to afford and be able to deliver the benefits of high performance, which comes with those environments. But actually, how do you do that in means and ways that that high performance and low latency doesn't introduce further complexity and challenge into the environment? Um, so a big part of what we're trying to do absolutely is, you know, focus around the analysis, looking at observability, looking at um, involving and making sure security teams to the point around shift left are engaged to evangelize and support and champion versus be blockers or approval authorities. So there's a lot of cultural you know, challenges which exist, which continue to exist, let's be honest, you know, in terms of our worlds in the last 20 years, the cornerstone has been around addressing and managing the cultural challenges of the business and how we deliver, you know, at the pace of the business, you know, with the outcomes of whether it's cloud first or migration from legacy environments. So I think certainly there's a lot of parallels in terms of what we do and how, you know, Ferguson, you know, go about understanding and managing their challenges. But the point of convergence is absolutely, you know, bringing it together, understanding that you're there to enable a frictionless customer first experience. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. And that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, in, in Vetify's mind, you know, as a vendor, you know, no surprise, we think machine identity management, along with, you know, an increasing number of other people think, you know, it's kind of a foundational principle uh, for, for establishing, you know, just really strong boundaries within which you can enable this shift left cloud first you know, culture, which, you know, which underpins all of the advantages of moving to the cloud, you know, specific to machine identity management, I'd love to get a, you know, to perhaps a more detailed sense as to how you think about machine identity management within the organization and how you actually go about Im implementing that. You know, Sean, you also mentioned, you know, about Kubernetes clusters, the traditional environment, some of the SaaS platforms, you know, I appreciate it gets really complex really quickly. So I'd, I'd love to understand, how do you think about identifying the machines and all of the, those interactions which are going on? So in the Kubernetes environment, um, one of the things that is key is being able to understand the different containers and how we enable them to interact with each other. And that's, that's really the business of, of service mesh. But in order for service mesh to work, it has to be tightly integrated with identity. And so, and so again, in the context of building our DevSecOps pipelines and understanding how we apply certificate management, things like code signing into that, uh, into that model and to pull that into that process as part of a natural uh, use of those systems in, in terms of how you build, manage, maintain, blow them away, restore them uh, is, is really key to being able to do that at, at scale. And it's very different, again, from the traditional environment where it's really mainly about managing certificates and hoping they don't expire so that stuff doesn't blow up and, and go bump in the night. Um, 
in in the cloud environment and in particular in a container environment that that gets massively scaled uh, very quickly and so the automation around it is just is just paramount yeah yeah, Man, I'm I'm assuming you'd concur and, and probably can add a little to that as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Everything that Sean's gone through that does resonate and, and so much more. I think we, we touched on it earlier. A lot of what is being landed, what we're experiencing now is fairly significant and complex change, none of which which will happen overnight, right? Whether that's the, the journey to the cloud, you know, migration away from, you know, on-prem, you know, insecure, fragmented, you know, workloads into, you know, modular microservice-based architecture, which is absolutely perimeterless and, you know, allows you to deliver at scale. None of that takes place overnight and very easily without things breaking. And, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, breaches and attacks and disruption. In 20 years of doing this, you know, and I was looking back at the organization that I've worked for in a lead capacity, the number of challenges we've had because of certificates failing or SSH keys you know, being taken down or APIs, uh, you know, eroding as a result of poor or incomplete management, you know, is untold, right? And, and this is just the world we're living in. So I think as we've introduced more complexity into it, as we try to better understand, and I think if I look at it from the point of abstraction, we try to better understand, you know, user interactions. So the user interactions, whether they be around fulfilling customer outcomes or engineering capability to be able to deliver efficient, you know, pipeline integration, you know, CI/CD, whatever that is, the whole span of that scale. And we try to develop better understanding of customer personas to be able to market and develop, you know, the right outcomes. It becomes increasingly harder, and it becomes increasingly harder because you're introducing more new technology that isn't understood that perhaps isn't brought in you know across the organization with the same clear understanding because generally what happens and in my experience in most organizations is you will have individuals who will evangelize a particular you know technology and they'll be on the leading edge or the cusp of a transformation and then it takes time for that to integrate and you know distill across the rest of the organization that in itself produces a challenge. And all of that talks to a cultural you know, headache, which most organizations, CXOs will, will challenge and face, but they'll address it in exactly the same way. So as Sean alluded, it's about you know, introducing that automation at the right point, improving the visibility, getting the observability where you need it to be. Having, you know, we're, we're so lucky today, having the depth and breadth of analytics data that we've never had before, and being able to use that to our advantage, whether it be internally or from a competitive perspective. You know, that's one thing that we do, and we absolutely have to continue to pivot and improve and find efficiency on. So, so much to do. Yeah, I think we've just started to, you know, chart a path through this. Yeah. Um, I also really like the reference to, you know, focusing on customer outcomes. Again, you know, it, I think that's really, really important. And as a, uh, as a vendor, you know, one of the questions we continue to think about is what, what is the value of the problem that we're solving? And why should our customer really, really care about that? And is there value associated with that? And I think that's a, that's a really good point there, Mum, to make is if you can't answer that question, you've got to really understand, you know, why, why are you doing this? Why, why are you moving to the cloud and, and stuff like that? Fantastic. So one of the things we've spoken about is, um, you know, speed and, and the importance of organizations to bring to market new solutions and just that ongoing demand to, to speed of execution. I just I'd love to get a sense as to, you know, how as a CISO you think about the trade off between, you know, the speed and agility and also the ongoing requirements for security and compliance. Because obviously, you know, cloud, cloud native, Kubernetes, all of that enables, you know, speed of execution. But how do you as CISOs think about, well, is it worth it? Yeah, I, I'm not sure we're going to have enough time to do it justice, but let me make a stab at it. It continues and will always be a challenge, you know, in terms of finding the right balance um, around, you know, not being overly prescriptive around delivering the right outcomes, but also finding the right balance of managing the risk, you know, and understanding it. So I think we talked a few minutes ago about 
how you enable that in means and ways that the organization can embrace, you know, whether it be shift left, you know, whether it be around, you know, instilling the right cultural values and behaviors. So I think for me, a big part of, you know, what I do today and what I've done in many organizations is it's, it's about the culture. It's about the people. It's about instilling the right mindset, getting that buy-in. So that has to be from, from the top, you know, and CXO, CXO level, you know, actually getting that insistence and understanding that, you know, we want to make the change. We want to go on that journey and it has to be the right journey that has to be sponsored, you know, at the highest level for that engagement and buy-in to be given. We are all, you know, as managers, as engineers, as developers, time poor, right? We're context switching, you know, all the time, introducing more complexity into already overloaded, you know, work schedules makes it makes it much more difficult to to do, but also introducing introduces the cost of you know more defects and challenges and emissions and mistakes. So it's about how you manage that and become aware of it and actually using the tools, right? So we've talked about for the last few minutes, you know, tools and automation and how can we streamline, you know, processes and activities and methods to be able to bring a little bit more clarity and purpose to those outcomes. But also a big part of it, you know, if we look at in, embellishing, enabling it all, is about education, right? So we're starting with culture in terms of getting the right appetite, getting the right mindset to be able to deliver the pace and the outcomes that the business expects, that the customers want to be delighted on but education awareness as is often the case with any security you know rounded initiative or awareness becomes key but also just keep it simple right i think a big part of what i have to rationalize as a CISO when it comes to managing the risk and you know responding to you know outcomes as a result of you know poor or misuse or configuration challenges or outages is simplicity is key simplicity in terms of customer outcome but also in terms of security fabric that allows you to deliver what you need to sure any additional observations anything to add to that for me it's really understanding in a very crisp way what are the touch points that need to happen in that next generation development cycle how do i get things from idea to production implementation and what are the security touch points along the way and then i feel like my my job has changed over the last several years from being a team and resource that that other teams come to to get security done for them to a team that's responsible for establishing a set of self-service capabilities so that those uh, services can be consumed and utilized in a consistent and reliable way as you go from that idea to to a production state, whether it's machine identity or, you know, code scanning or setting up proxies for APIs or managing pieces of how we configure service mesh or building virtual machines or whatever the case may be, um, providing that automation and providing those tools as consumable services back into my development organization so that they're not having to come and ask for each of those things discreetly and wait is uh is a key to to where we need to head and need to continue to drive i think that's a perfect example of how we can enable that speed and agility yet still put those security compliances in place around these sort of self-service models and i'd love to quickly just delve into um a, you know an, an increasingly hot topic for sort of machine identity for security which is really the, the software supply chain increasingly you know every month that comes by there's new attacks which are enabled by people you know taking advantage of security weaknesses within organizational software supply chain and taking advantage of, of potentially you know weaknesses within identity within the software supply chain and and shifting to the cloud i think also you know that potentially exacerbates the project as people increase increasingly implement and reuse open source code. And there's you know, plenty of opportunity for um, confusion and, and, and malpractice to be introduced. You know, as CISOs, how do you think about securing that software supply chain within your CSED, both you know, within code that you write yourselves and potentially with code that you actually bring in from vendors? For us, it, it starts with tight controls over our code repositories. What are we gonna allow developers to use and include into our applications? and getting a, um, a, a trustworthy look at that 
on the front end before um, before you have developers that are bringing that out of Git repositories and into into the code that they're building. And then for ourselves, we uh, we're quickly driving to a point where we want to we want to do code signing with all of our critical software so that so that uh, those that utilize and trust our software, whether it be for customer use or for other business consumption, uh, they uh, they can know and validate and understand that Ferguson stands behind that piece of code before they uh, start to make use of it. Yeah, fantastic. And is that something that you're forcing into your supply chain as well, Sean? Or do you, you know, are, are you really just, you know, creating all of the code yourselves and then validating it? Or do you pass that through into your vendors? I, it's it's a little bit of both. You know, we, we do a lot of uh, microservices interconnection through API and most of our API connectivity uh, when it occurs between the Ferguson business and other other suppliers is proxied through our uh, our our API gateway, and so we apply a lot of uh, consistency in how we look at and how we broker those connections, so that we're not as far into the other side of that as um, as we might otherwise be. Um, but when it comes to development and consumption of code. Uh, for construction of our own applications, that's that's a pretty tightly controlled process internally. Great. And Mun, how about how about your good sales at Trainline? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, what Sean's talked through there. Similarly, in terms of the control and management, you know, of pipelines and development process, certainly internally, is something that we continue to mature. <laughs> something that we continue to maintain a very, very close, tight rein on. But I think to your point that you made earlier, a lot of what we do is around introducing guardrails. Yeah, the concept of, you know, this is a pipeline, this is outcome, this is scanning requirements, this is, uh, you know, whatever it may be. Our job, my job, my team's job is to ensure that we have a safe operating environment for engineers, for developers, for compliance teams to be able to deliver what they need in means and ways that is efficient and effective. And I think that's a big part of the conversation and that internally is something that we maintain, you know, absolutely a laser focus on and we use tooling and automation and controls to be able to deliver that. But certainly from the supply side, you know, into the third parties, whether it be through API or other gateways, we absolutely try and because of the, the nature of the interactions, you know, what is being communicated, what is being shared, and the efficiency by which you know we want to be able to allow that to happen it's about being you know measured you know being sensible about what you do and and how you do it and having robust you know lines of you know communication and, and knowing that when things do break or do go wrong you absolutely have a focus around you know minimizing disruption and, and return to green i think that's a yeah that's the only thing that i would would want to highlight yeah yeah, I'd love to get your sort of sort of your one topic which which keeps you awake as a CISO in terms of the move, the cloud native environments, and you know the ongoing migration into these more agile, flexible, uh, di distributed environments that you know we're all increasingly working within. There's many, right? And I think for me, simply is around we're just going to see a continuous explosion, you know, an advance of data democratization, yeah, and the use of you know cloud workloads, public, hybrid, otherwise to be able to cul cultivate you know, and allow that to happen just makes it increasingly scary yeah, in terms of what we do and how we do it. So it's twofold, right? You want to be able to do this to be able to introduce even more powerful outcomes for customer. Yeah, absolutely. That's at the heart of what you do. But in doing that, you're treading a path of increasing the attack surface. And, you know, you've got to focus on mitigation. You've got to focus on compensating control, but understand that this is just changing beyond the realms of, you know, understanding. Yeah. That's what concerns me. Yeah. I'd tag on to that, you know, really, really more of the same. I mean, this this world that we're operating in and our ability to service customers and to get closer to them and be able to provide uh, for the types of services that, that they need to be able to consume is increasing every day from a complexity perspective. And it 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 lives well outside of my direct control and so being able to understand that and being able to put some guardrails around it 
and be able to being able to understand that you have to live with uh, some level of risk uh, in order to be able to function and operate as a business is increasingly apparent. Um, I don't control all of it. And so I have to be able to at, at least get some insight and visibility into how this fits together and bring some sense to the complexity around it so that we can manage the risk. Fantastic. Mun, Sean, well, thank you so much. We're out of time. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you both this afternoon. Thank you. Great conversation. Thank you for having me.